Welcome to your American Diabetes Association Safe at School Fall Back to School series. Tonight's discussion is the first part of our three part back to school series, highlighting several T1D parents who are reflecting upon their experiences of sending their child with diabetes to school during the global pandemic. I'm Crystal Woodward. I am the ADA's director of the Safe at School campaign. And I am also a parent of a now grown child with type one diabetes. And I am your moderator this evening. So sit back to take all of this in and know that together we can make sure our kids are safe at school. Now let me introduce our panelists. First, we have Jennifer Holgree, who lives in Centerville, Maryland. Hi, Jen. Hi. With her, hi, with her husband, Chris, and their three children. Two of their daughters live with type one diabetes. One was diagnosed at the age of six, and the other daughter was diagnosed through a research study of siblings of type one kids at the age of 12. Jennifer has been an ADA advocacy volunteer for nine years, including her volunteer work as a Safe at School advocate. Next, we have Dr. Sean O'Loughlin and his wife, Claudia O'Loughlin, who live in Bowie, Maryland with their three children. Their youngest child, Sinai, now age nine, was diagnosed with type one diabetes in February of this year. They took all their children for their annual physical checkup and Sinai's blood sugar reading results were high, resulting in Sinai's admission to the Children's National Medical Center in Washington, DC, where her diagnosis was confirmed. So I welcome all of you tonight. Thank you in advance for sharing your time, sharing your experiences. Um, we really appreciate it. So let's get started. Um, so Jennifer, uh, yeah. describe your recollections of your children's diagnoses. Um, did you suspect that your daughters had diabetes? How have you and your family shifted or adjusted to support your children with diabetes? Um, we had no idea with my youngest, my uh, middle child, Allison, when she was diagnosed at six, we knew nothing about diabetes. Um, I was worried about her. I called her pediatrician and listed off a few symptoms like losing weight, being very sleepy, all of a sudden wetting the bed when she was six. Um, and he said, immediately bring her to us. He bent down and smelled her breath and said, we're putting her in an ambulance immediately. Like he knew instantly. Uh, we still at that time knew nothing about what was happening. Um, she was admitted into the pediatric ICU for two days. Um, and then we spent another three days at the hospital learning about what type one diabetes was. It was a shock, something we had no idea about. Um, and we threw ourselves into trying to understand what was happening and what was going on. Um, I stepped back from my job that I was traveling, uh, switched career paths completely just so I could be more at home. And I'm super glad I did. I'm glad we were, our family was offered that opportunity for me to make that shift in my life. Um, because it has made me be able to be an advocate as well as be there for my kids and, and be around in different ways. So I really appreciate that. And it also threw our other child into this study. We did not know she would have it. They did markers of the trial net study and discovered her markers five years ago. It did take five years for her to eventually be diagnosed, but she stayed in that study for five years. So that's how we got to where we are now. <laughs> okay. And Claudia and Sean, your recollections of Sinai's diagnosis? Did you suspect she had diabetes? And how has your family um, adjusted to support your child with diabetes? Well, like you said, um, this is all new to us. It was quite a shock. Um, although um, diabetes have been around, um, we have become conscious of, of of it now that it's at our doorsteps. Um, Sanaya at the age of eight showed no symptoms. She was active. Um, the only thing we noticed I think was one time she wet the bed, but we just brushed it off as nothing. Um, she didn't have the raspy smell of the breath or anything. So that, um, you know, we, we, we were just 
confused and lost. How could this happen? But um, the family as a whole, you know, we stepped up, made the changes that we needed to make, um, which include changing our diet, eating a little more healthier, being a little more physical. Um, and we, we have done it as a family together. So Sinai doesn't feel, you know, left out or anything. But um, it, it has been quite an experience uh, thus far for us. Okay. Well, thank you. And we just, as we we're talking about earlier, we just, we just keep on, right? We just keep on going. Thank you for sharing that. Um, Claudia and Sean, what are some of the daily challenges you experience in caring for Sinai as a child with diabetes? Um, I think one of the, our biggest challenge is more psychological um, in the sense where at times she refuses to eat, not that she's not hungry, but because she doesn't want to take um, the medication, the insulin. And um, we kind of understand that because um, of her age and you know having to take this shot before or after a meal can be um, you know wearing on her. Um, sometimes we have to um, give her a treat, you know, so she can um, take the shot. Once she takes the shot, she gets a treat. It doesn't happen all the time, but that. That has been quite a challenge. Um, and again, there is the, the intense managing plan of calculating, um, monitoring her, 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 her carbs, um, exercising, giving the insulin, it, it's, it's so much. And we only had a day to learn all of this in the hospital. We have to compound all this information, how to inject when, how to calculate, you know, it, it, it was overwhelming for us, but it was something that we had to learn. We had to learn it quickly for the health and safety of, of our daughter. It's a constant uh, juggling act mm -hmm. and a continuous uh, math problem. Yes. Yeah. Right. Yes. Right. Well, but one of the things that I, I think helped us is uh, when we got the, the Dexcom, the glucose monitoring system, uh, uh, prior to that, uh, we would have to either stay up until 2 a.m. in the morning to check her levels or go to sleep and, and set an alarm to get up uh, so that we can check to make sure that it wasn't falling. Uh, but once we got the Dexcom then we were able to sleep a little bit better. Um, even sometimes now, uh, I still have my doubts. And so I still, you know, get up at two o'clock automatically to, to just to check. check. Uh, but, but yes, so that was, and then uh, while doing this, uh, we would be, have, probably have to go to work at eight o'clock in the morning. So I'm, <laughs> I'm dragging around the house at six o'clock in the morning, feeling sleepy from being up Two or three o'clock in the morning, so it's 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 been a challenge and challenge uh, for us. But uh, we've kind of set a, a schedule um, between us uh, so that we uh, and that's how we have handled that. Very good. That's good. And, and Jen, what have been your biggest challenges with Allie and Sammy? Um, so I would say teenage years. I'm going to say teenage years. Um, when they. Allie hit teenage, she became, we wanted her to be more self-sufficient and, and do things on her own. And she definitely, it was, a, it's a battle. It was been a battle. It was a battle. She's definitely gotten much better at it as she's gone, gotten older into her older teens. Um, now that she's 16, almost 17, she's definitely taking her health more seriously than she did, let's say three years ago when she was in her early teens. Um, and I think that came from having it for a while from when she was six um, little burnout, mental health is definitely a situation with people who have a chronic disease. Um, and we addressed that. And I think that helped her a lot. Um, Sammy's been fine. It's only been, 
two years for her or a year, year and a half for her or something like that. So she saw her sister dealing with it, but I think she's dealt with it much better in her teen, early teen years um, because she was diagnosed in her teen years. Where, whereas Allie, I think that teen years, the teen years are super fun. <laughs> I'm going to just say it that way. So it, well, they're fun know. anyway, and it can even, even more yeah. fun <laughs> with a child with diabetes. So yes, yes. absolutely. Absolutely. Great. Um, so Jennifer, what are some measures? We're going to switch gears here a little bit and start talking about school and, and COVID. Um, Jen, what are some measures you have taken to make sure your daughters are safe and have access to all opportunities at school? Um, that's the first part of the question. The second part is what have you done differently as the result of COVID-19? Sure. Um, the first thing we, we did with Allison right away was get a 504 plan in place with the school. And that has been our saving grace, I think, since the beginning, because we've always had it since the first, when she started back to school after diagnosis. Um, and that 504 has carried with us then through elementary, through middle school, and even into high school. Um, and it's been the same. We've just adjusted it as she's grown or as the school has gone with us. So we've been very blessed with having that started early with her right away in that elementary school that it then moved to the middle school and it moved to the high school with us. And it was an expectation that just went with her. So I think that was definitely helpful for us. Um, and we were able to talk through any issues or things that, to determine and make sure that she was getting all the same opportunities as everyone else um, from field trips to testing to all those different things that might come up. Um, and it definitely helped. Once COVID hit, Allie actually didn't go back to school. She decided to stay at home. So I think that was the decision. However, Samantha, my younger, did decide to go to school. And with her, we were just very conscientious of her making sure she was telling us how she felt, talking with the school nurse and how she felt, um, and that making sure she didn't have to leave the classroom if she wanted, didn't need to, but if she wanted to or felt uncomfortable, that she was also allowed. because our COVID rules in our school were very strict, like no students wandering in the hallway kind of strict. So it was just making sure she had an open opportunity to move around and do what she needed to do as well as she was cov face covers and stuff like that. Um, and she didn't ride the bus. We didn't have her ride the bus. We took her and picked her up, different things like that um, to make her feel more comfortable. The school was also more comfortable with that too, I think. So those are kind of the things. Um, again, Allie decided to stay home. We were able to have that choice for her. So with the virtual versus in-school options that were there. And were there any special um, 504 accommodations that you put in place for Allie for her virtual learning? We didn't feel we needed to actually yet okay, so, um, mm -hmm. because of the way her testing and the way the classes worked you know, it we didn't feel that was necessary because there was no state testing or state mandated testing this year. We are going to look into that for what happens for next year. And we're going to have those discussions um, because COVID may have gone like it, the restrictions may be loosened, but it's still there. So we're, we're still concerned about she is vaccinated, but what will happen? What could happen? Those kind of things. So we're still thinking about it and trying to figure out what we're going to do next year. We're still being in it for 10 years, this COVID has definitely changed a lot of our thoughts and how things are. And it's definitely changed our mental health and how we're thinking about things too, with other chronic disease like diabetes, so. Thank you. Um, Claudia and Sean, what are some of the measures you have taken to make sure Sinai is safe and has access to all school opportunities? And um, what has been the impact of COVID on Sinai's ability to attend and participate at school. And you're on mute, Claudia. There Just, you go. Um, Jennifer stated, we too um, turned in all our paperwork uh, to the school nurse to implement um, the 504 plan. Um, that we're still working on. It's been um, a struggle getting that um, established, but, um, we made it very clear with school professionals, um, counselor, administrative team, you know, how important in establishing this 504 plan is for Sinai. Um, she should not be excluded 
out of any activities, um, everything that other kids participate in, she too should be able to participate in that. Um, they're just requesting other documentations from um, the doctors, which we have furnished, um, you know, contacted Children Hospital. They told us everything that they've given us should suffice in setting up that 504 plan. Um, so we're still at the table trying to get that 504 plan um, um, put together for Sinai. So hopefully um, before the start of the fall school year, it will be ready for day one. Okay. And um, did Sinai, did she, did she do the in-person learning or virtual learning? She did uh, virtual, yeah. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay, so did she have any accommodations for virtual in terms of you know, for example, um, if she ha had to treat a low, could she go off camera? Was that incorporated? Well, in her we, we, did, we did speak about that. Um, her teachers did acknowledge that she would be excused um, for that time, but nothing, again, is in writing as a protective measure for her. Mm -hmm. Okay. okay. Um, so, Sean and Claudia, your daughter was diagnosed earlier this year during the global pandemic, right, right in the thick of it. What are some of the resources and information that were most helpful to you after her diagnosis? Um, and what resources and information didn't you have that you wish you had? Well, um, I think the information that we received most of all from uh, her, ped her pediatrician, uh, the endocrinology team at uh, Children's National, uh, they gave us actually a binder, even though it was a lot of information uh, compact into such a short period of time. Uh, it was uh, very useful in that we could just we could just go back to the binder and 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 read over things every day and uh, go onto the internet and and you know research certain things if we if we don't quite understand or the ability to be able to just call the hospital and somebody respond to us. Uh, if we had a question, it didn't matter what time it was, uh, they would respond uh, to us with the questions that we had. And then uh, we got uh, this book from the hospital called the Calorie King book that contains uh, the amount of carbs in every food that you can possibly think about. Them. And that was so helpful uh, because we really didn't understand how to read the nutritional facts on, on the back so that we had good examples from the Calorie King book that helped us. And then we also had the, the app because the calculation could have been so overwhelming, you know, all this information coming at you and then, and then they're telling you to uh, calculate and, and so forth. Uh, so we had the T1, D1 insulin calculator app. Uh, and that helped us to calculate the amount of insulin that should be administered. And all that's needed is just the blood glucose reading uh, and the number of carbs that uh, should be eaten. And so those are the, three are the major things that we, uh, we really found to, to be helpful to us. That's awesome. Very good. And what about in terms of um, support? Have you been able to talk to other parents of children with type 1 diabetes, um, has an I had an opportunity to meet other children? Is that something that you guys want to do or? That is you... something we um, would love to do. Like we um, mentioned to Jen before, um, we would speak with Sinai. We did tell her about your daughters <laughs> and she said, okay. <laughs> She's a bit shy, but she said, okay. She would like that, but um, you know, according to her, she still doesn't want anyone knowing, you know, mm -hmm. that she has um, the diabetes. Okay. So it's moving, it will get there, but slowly. Camp is a great place for yes. children with diabetes. So check it out. Yes, we will. Yeah, great. Um, and what about sending Sinai back to school? during the global pandemic? She's newly diagnosed. Um, how did that go? And 
What were your worries and what conversations did you have with your daughter's school? Um, did you have concerns? Were your concerns addressed at school? Many of um, our concerns, you know, um, being that she didn't physically go back into the building, like some kids had the hybrid, she remained home. Um, some of our concerns were um, turning off the camera when she needs to um, be administered insulin. Um, what happens if her numbers are too high? Sometimes she needs to rest. Can she, you know, take a 15 minute break and rest? Um, or if they're too low, sometimes in the morning when she gets up, she's fatigued, real weak. You know, we share those concerns with the um, school. And yeah, we just wish we had a stronger support team in the school. And yeah. Okay. Sean, did you want to add anything to that? Yeah, I was, I was about to say, but one of, the, one of the major concerns that I had was this 504 plan. It seemed as if, uh, and, and getting it implementing it, I mean, it seems as if we, um, we are moving quickly in trying to get things accomplished. And uh, everybody else seemed to be moving in slow motion. Uh, so that has definitely been a challenge. Uh, they said that it, it, com it consisted, the 504 plan consisted of two parts. We one, is, one portion is academic and uh, the other portion is health. And uh, well, we, at this point, we weren't too concerned about the, the, uh, the health portion because uh, she was remaining at home with us at least until the fall. Uh, but we more, were more concerned about the academic portion uh, and, you know, in terms of returning to school when she was, was able to go back or when she gets back to the building, uh, you know, questions like uh, what happens uh, when there's a substitute teacher, um, you know, and so my, my, my concern is accountability. Who's the one uh, that's going to take responsibility uh, for her when the um, major teacher, when a particular teacher is not there. For example, when her home move teacher uh, has to be absent for whatever reason and there's a substitute, then what happens? So, you know, accountability is one of my biggest concern and communication back and forth between the school and myself or the school and us really. Uh, and, and so I really find that, you know, troubling if I'm not getting the kind of communication, if they're moving slow and, and they're not, uh, you know, approaching this, it doesn't appear as if it's being, as if, as if it's being approached in a serious manner. Um, so emails are coming slowly uh, and so forth. Uh, so, so that's my major concern. And, and, and surely you could see, um, you know, the difficulty with that, because then uh, am I supposed to trust you with my, my daughter? Um, if, if things are moving slow now, uh, what's going to happen when school reopens? Suppose, suppose when school reopens, you have four people with type 1 diabetes, then what? Mm -hmm. uh, so those are my, you know, my, my major concerns with, with the school and the system. Okay. And then there's a school nurse. Is there a school nurse at school? There is a school nurse. Okay. And we, Great. we did meet with the school nurse. Very good. And we spoke with her for um, quite quite a bit, and uh, and so and she kind of put us a little bit more at ease, <laughs> really, so to speak. Wonderful. But you know, there's that tendency as a parent still to be worried about certain things. So, um, yeah. Okay. Um, so those are your biggest concerns. I think you've just articulated your biggest concerns about Sinai going back to in-person learning in the fall. Um, Jennifer, what are your biggest concerns for your daughters in terms of going back to school this fall, you know, thinking about COVID, right. thinking about um, readjusting after having, um, you know, an adjusted schedule or, you know, a virtual or a hybrid schedule this past school year? And, and how will you address those concerns? Um, Mike? Well, my biggest concern for Sam, my youngest, is that she's starting high school. It's a very new experience for her. Um, I've worked with a high school though with Allison, so I, I, I'm 
I guess I'm lucky in the fact that I have one that's already there. So it helps them know me and they know um, my expectations already. So I'm lucky, let's say. Um, but I'm also nervous about Sam. Sam is newly diagnosed in the sense that she's not had it for very long either. And she's adjusting herself to what it feels like um, and what her body feels like. So I'm I'm very nervous about the high school, the big the largeness of a high school and, and Sam herself. Um, definitely we have the 504 already in place. So that's a good thing. But I'm also nervous about standardized testing comes back and it's much bigger in high school and testing is much more important in high school, AP tests or other kinds of tests. And it, 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 the grades matter more um, in high school. So making sure that she has the necessary accommodations to take breaks during testing and things like that. Um, I haven't gotten a lot of pushback with Allison. She hasn't needed that, but I feel, feel that Sam might. So I know that that's going to be, I think my, my biggest concern is her starting high school with this disease um, new to her. Um, I'm not that concerned about Allison. I feel like she knows her body. She knows her, how she feels. We definitely have a solid 504 already in place for her. And I think having that in place for her for years has helped. Um, so I'm, I really have my nerves about Samantha. Now I'm going to say again, everybody doesn't, nobody knows this, but I work in the high school that my daughters go to. So I'm, also blessed in the fact that I'm right there. So my concerns aren't as, I think, as large as others might be, but they are there and every parent should be concerned, you know, have their concerns and make sure they address those directly with the school and try to make your voice heard, so. Okay. Um, so Jen, you've been parenting children with diabetes for quite some time. And I'm wondering if you have any advice for parents of children with diabetes as they prepare to send their children back to school full time this fall. Maybe you could give us your maybe top three sure. tips or recommendations. It could be three, yeah. four, five, whatever you're thinking. Well, my top three are communicate, communicate, communicate. But it, it, it all and as Sean was saying, it's the communication or the lack of communication or it's all about communication um, and, and the parent feeling comfortable as well as the school feeling comfortable. Um, when Allison was first diagnosed, my biggest thing was I got right in the school and I got in their face <laughs> and I, a mama bared it is what I considered it. And I, I was like, I'm not leaving until you make me feel better about my child being at school with you. Um, our school did already have two children with type one, which I did not know about, obviously. It was not my knowledge to know, but um, those parents introduced themselves to me. They were told about me. Um, they gave me their tips. And, and the biggest tip was to create the 504 and to communicate with your school nurse. Become their number one, become their, become smarter than the school nurse about diabetes. So I did. I dove myself into it and I tried to figure out my child's needs because every kid is different and every kid experiences diabetes differently. And I think that's one thing to remember is that one kid reacts differently than another child and their symptoms might be different in the way they react. One might be on a pump, mom, mom might be sticking needles into their arm. One might have a Dexcom, another one might be still pricking their finger, which is fine. It just, whatever works best for their child, but the school nurse needs to accommodate your child. And, and I think communicating with the nurse and becoming that nurse's, you know, go-to person for your child is important. Communicating with the school. My second communication is the school counselor because they all help with their schedule, but they also are the person that your student can go to for mental health needs or questions or concerns, or if they're feeling like they're different, those kind of things are super important that, that your child feels comfortable with that individual. And then the administration. And I'm going to say the administration has always been my headbutt. The school nurse has always been on my side. Uh, the psycho the counselor and psychologist have always been on my side. I butt heads with the administration. Uh, our high school did not allow bag carrying last year. They didn't allow kids to carry bags, uh, no backpacks. You had to carry everything in your hand. Well, my daughter in her 504 is allowed to carry her supplies with her every class she goes. Otherwise, I'd have to supply so many classrooms with backup materials. Um, so I butted heads with the administration. And we got it worked out. And now every child with type one diabetes in the school can carry a backpack with them 
or a bag with them wherever they go. So it was all about communication though and keeping those lines of communication open, not being a negative communication. Like I was always on the positive side, trying to spin it in a great way or, or making sure they see that it actually works best for the school if you allow this to happen for these children um, and be that resource for the school and, and keep those lines of communication open. That's my biggest advice for any parent dealing with this. Thank you. Uh, Claudia and Sean, I'm going to let you have the last word. Do you have any reaction to Jennifer's recommendations or any closing thoughts as we move forward uh, with their children into the next school year? Well, I, I'm, I'm really happy that uh, Jennifer was able to do that. And hopefully and that's the case in our county. <laughs> and um, I don't have to call her for advice. on. <laughs> I'm here if you need it. <laughs> Uh, but 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 yes, um, we we really um, appreciate um, you know your your thoughts, Jennifer. You've done this for a, a longer time than we have, and uh, and so we're just uh, learning. But still, we we are willing to share whatever we've learned with anybody else, even though we are not that experienced. Only a few months <laughs> in, um, but we are really grateful for for you know you you all. Uh, Crystal and uh, Jennifer uh, for having us here and for us to be able to share yes. and uh, for us to, you know, kind of encourage each other as well. So we thank you very much for that. Well, I, I thank you, um, our tonight, tonight's panelists, Claudia, Sean, Jennifer. Um, thank you for sharing your stories, your personal stories. Um, I know that goes a long way in, in helping to give other parents confidence that they can do this and that they can keep their children with diabetes safe and healthy at home and at school. Um, and to the attendees and, and everyone watching this, we hope this guidance and information has been helpful to you as you prepare to send your children back to school in this 2021-22 school year. It's a little unusual. Um, to say the least, and I guess not as unusual as last year, but still, you know, it, it's a learning curve. Please know the American Diabetes Association is here for you. Um, please check out our information uh, about uh, legal protections for students with diabetes and best practices in the school setting. You can find all of that information on our website at diabetes.org forward slash safe at school. Um, also, a link to our forum tonight will soon be made available if you'd like to watch it again or share it with parents or other friends um, who are responsible for providing care to children with diabetes. And also, I wanted to tell you about um, our, the next um, part two of our three-part series. This was part one, but um, Sarah has typed um, information into the, um, the chat box about our next series. But our next series will be um, an, a panel, an expert panel discussion of preparing to send our children back to school. We will have a pediatric endocrinologist, we'll have a pediatric diabetes educator, we'll have a, um, a, a psychologist, we'll have a school nurse, and then I will be there too to also help to provide input about legal protections. But that's gonna be on July 15th, I believe at 1230 uh, PM Eastern Standard Time. So be, be on the lookout for that. Uh, Sarah just posted the link, but also be out, uh, look on the, on the lookout for the link um, in social media. Um, well, I, again, I thank the panelists and I thank everyone for attending tonight and um, best of luck and for a safe and healthy school year. Thank you and good night. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.